All right. Okay, so now let's go into the interactive boundary layer equation. Okay, so we'll load the fits. And uh, instead of pre prescribing UE, we are prescribing UI, right? And uh, let's copy the same residual function just to get an initial condition. So we are going to paste the same residual function here uh, and uh, name it a residual non-interactive. Okay. So in the initial condition, we are going to do f solve of residual non-interactive, and instead of h, uh, h instead of the three variables, we are just going to be doing two variables, and we're going to remove these, and we're going to, well, here it doesn't matter, so let's do the same as what we did in the in the two equation solve. All right. So now, h uh, is equal to that theta is equal to that ue starts with zero and we are going to initialize our three variable equation h theta 2 ue is going to be the previous solution and ue okay so this is the initial condition for our coupled quasi one dimensional flow and boundary equation solver all right interrupt me whenever you have any questions so we also want to fix the residual to also be order one, right? So we try we'll try to divide things by uh I think I think I may not have the right interface on this one, so I uh, let me see. So H231 let me see. So this we, we first want to fix the interface of the non-interactive solver. So starting from here, it should be, I'll just paste over here. Okay, so new here, DUE DX. Oh, we still need DUE DX and the UE of one DX. So, uh, DUE DX we only need it at the initial condition so it's equal to 2 right <coughs> sorry <coughs> and UE would be equal to 0 okay so that's only for getting the initial condition and we call it DC so this is, let's see if we get the right thing. Okay, let's see, my H, oops, we don't get the right thing. Uh, oh, here, this is the problem. We'll, this also needs to be, so this is the argument. We are not uh, putting the right argument into the sofa. Okay, let's run it again. H. Okay, so that's the same thing as we got last time, right? Oh. calling that non-interactive function once. Was that's right, oh. to get the initial that's condition. Initial condition. That's right, that's right. Okay, so in the interactive, all of these are still correct. And the only thing we need to deal with is, let's modify this to get rid of the news. Whenever we have theta 2, we divide by new. We have theta 2 divided by new. Okay, and here we get rid of the multiply by new and get rid of the multiply by new. Theta 2 is going to be divided by new and theta 2 is going to be divided by new. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, the third equation is still correct. All right. So let's try to run it. What's the third equation? <laughs> Uh, the third equation here is what we derived last time for the mass balance. So uh, let me see the third equation. If you let's navigate to what we had last time uh, here, here, right? So so we basically is saying that uh, the mass flow rate is going to be the same. 
but the channel is going to be the width of the channel is going to be dis decreased by twice the displacement thickness all right so so instead of uh, instead of having a ui which would be multiplied by the height of the channel which is unknown we would be equal to ue multiplied by the same height minus two times delta star so this is uh, this is like the third equation okay and this is equal to a constant uh this is equal to a constant so basically from this ui which is given we are going to figure out the uh, we are going to figure out the basically h over that constant and then substitute it into here we are going to we are going to have a relationship between ue and delta star so that's the third equation okay uh, now let's again in the in this solver let's obtain the flag and uh, a stop if flag is less than zero and again let's say c is equal to c of one to length h okay let's now solve it so it's solving all the time steps and again it stops all right it stopped a little bit later than the previous case right where h instead of stopping at 3.5 it goes all the way to slightly after separation so this is what happens when the Reynolds number is too high that you really shouldn't be using this uh, quasi one d flow because if you think of a quasi one d flow with the widening channel so this is the case we have right now and if the boundary layer is very very thin so this is the case like re based on the height of the channel is about 10 to the 5 right so if the boundary layer is very thin even though it creates a separation over here the separation over here is very small scale it's small compared to the height of the channel so you have a you have a scenario where the geometry variation of the channel due to the separation is not smooth Okay, and in this case, the quasi one D flow breaks down. And uh, if if you look at the Jacobian, you you find that when the Reynolds number is low enough, you can prove that. So if the delta star over H is is large enough, the separation, the singularity, of the separating flow would not occur. But if this is too small, you can still have the same singularity that prevents you from converging, although it will be delayed. So in this case, let's slowly increase the viscosity. So let's put it to be 5 to see uh, the, the interactive boundary layer method working. All right. So OK, so this is the solution we got after we increase the viscosity from 10 to the minus 5 to 5 times 10 to the minus 5. So the first plot shows the theta, the momentum thickness. What we discovered is very interesting. So it peaks at a certain point and then decreases. The second shows h. Okay. So it goes all the way to something like 8,000. Of course, it doesn't really make much. I mean, our fit would probably be wrong when H goes to 8,000 because we fit it only to up to 10 or so, right? But what is H? H is the ratio between the displacement thickness and momentum thickness. So if you want to plot the momentum thickness, plot c and h times theta thetas or theta or thetas okay you get something like this so it's going to be huge i mean the reason we we are uh the reason that delta is huge at the end is because we set the inviscid velocity to be a parabola at the end the inviscid velocity is going to be going back to zero right 
So if you think of a quasi-1D flow, that means the area goes to infinity. Okay, so, so at some point you have to have the uh, boundary layer occupying it's like infinite space for the solution to, to work. But now let's start to zoom in a little bit. So you can see this is the location where the flow is separating, right? So 1.2 something. And that also, that corresponds to where the edge crosses about four. All right. And another thing is, if you also plot our third variable, which is UE. Okay, let's do a subplot for UE. Uh, okay, so let's make three. Okay, let's run this. So this is what we see. Again, this is momentum thickness. This is shape factor. And this is our UE. As opposed to UI, which goes down. So let's actually plot UI. Uh, plot C UI. Did I? Uh, oh, I forgot to hold on. Okay, so we can see that. UI and UE almost agrees up to this point. So that's the boundary layer edge velocity. And starting from where the flow separates, okay, they rapidly diverge. So basically UE, which is the red line, stays constant in order to prevent my H star from going down below than what is possible. Right. That's what happens in the second equation. D H star D X is gonna be driven by D U E D X. So if my D U E D X keeps being negative like this, my H star has to drop below what is possible, so that couldn't happen. And uh, uh, the the coupling actually prevents the U E from going down. 